السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله قال رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم زدنا علما All praise and thanks is due to Allah Azza wa Jal Peace and salutations upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah Salawatullahi wa salamu alayh Peace and salutations upon his family, upon his friends And upon all those who try to emulate him until the end of times Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum A warm welcome to each and everyone To our fifth lesson Regarding our book Riyadh al-Salihin The Gardens of the Righteous And Inshallah before we carry on Please just excuse Me for the lesson today As I have a bit of A cold, a bit of some sniffles So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala To grant all those that are sick Shifa bi-idhnillahi ta'ala And we are still continuing with the chapter of sincerity and intentions and this is hadith number 6 wa an abi ishaq sa'd ibn abi waqas malik ibn uhayb ibn abdul manaf ibn zuh ratabni kilab ibn murra ibn ka'b ibn luay al qurashi al zuhri radiyallahu an أحد المب عشرة المشهود لهم بالجنة رضي الله عنهم قال جاني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعودني عام حجة الوداع من وجع من وجع اشتد بي فقلت يا رسول الله إني قد بلغ ب من الوجع ما ترى وأنا ذو مال ولا يرثني إلا ابنة لي أفأتصدق بثلثي مال قال لا قلت فالشطر يا رسول الله فقال لا قلت فالثلث يا رسول الله قال الثلث والثلث كثير أو كبير إنك انتذر ورثتك أغنياء خير من أن تذرهم على يتكففون الناس وإنك لن تنفق نفقة تبتغي بها وجه الله إلا أجرت عليها حتى ما تجعل في في أمرأتك قال فقلت يا رسول الله أخلف بعد أصحابي قال إنك لن تخلف فتعمل عملا تبتغي به وجه الله إلا أزددت به درجة ورفعة ولعلك أن تخلف حتى تنتفع بك أقوام ويضر بك آخرون اللهم أمضي لأصحاب هجرتهم ولا تردهم على أعقابكم لكن البائس سعد بن خولة يرثي له رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن مات بمكة متفق Ali. So translating the hadith And before we translate the hadith This hadith is a bit of a lengthy hadith And there are a lot of benefits In this hadith There's a lot of fawaid in the hadith And Inshallah In tonight's lesson we will be Just looking and focusing on this Particular hadith So we'll just be looking at one hadith And we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that He puts barakah in our time and that we are able to explain and elaborate on this beautiful sayings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
This hadith is narrated by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas was one of the ten that were given the glad tidings of Jannah. He says, The Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He visited me during my illness, whilst I was sick, which became severe in the year of the Hajjatul Wada, the farewell pilgrimage. So I said, O Rasul Allah, O Messenger of Allah, you can see the pain which I am suffering, and I am a man of means, and there is none to inherit from me except one daughter. Should I give two-thirds of my property in charity? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. I asked him, should I give half? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. Then I asked, can I give away one-third? He, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, give away one third and that is still too much. It is better to leave your ears well off than to leave them poor begging people. You will not expend a thing in charity for the sake of Allah, but you will be rewarded for it. Even the morsel of food in which you feed your wife. I said, O Messenger of Allah, would I survive my companions? He said, if you survive others and accomplish a thing for the sake of Allah, you would gain higher ranking and standing. You will survive them. Your survival will be beneficial to the people, yani meaning to the Muslim, and harmful to others, meaning to those enemies of Islam. You will survive others till the people will derive benefit from you and others would be harmed by you. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, O oh Allah, complete for my companions the immigration, meaning the hijrah, and do not cause them to retract. Sa'ad ibn Khawla was unfortunate. Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he died or he passed away in Mecca. This hadith is narrated by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. So the author, and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower him with blessings, he brings this hadith from, reported from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to visit him during an illness. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he was ill. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he comes to visit him, and this was still in the Mecca stages, because this happened in Mecca. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, he was also one of the immigrants who made the hijrah from Mecca to Medina. So he was a muhajir. And they left Mecca only for the sake of Allah, who subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, the sublime. He left Mecca only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we discussed this in previous ahadith. What we also learn from this that it was the practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was the practice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to visit the sick. The Prophet peace be upon him he would visit the sick amongst his companions, as he would visit others too. He is the best in character, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, amongst the people, coupled with the fact that he, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the leader of the people. So, here we take an important lesson, which we'll cover a bit later, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of his sunnah was to visit the ill. It was to visit those that were sick and Allah azza wa jal knows best. So he came to visit Sa'ad. And Sa'ad says to him, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can see that I am suffering a great deal of pain. Meaning he was afflicted with severe pain. And I am a man of great wealth. 
So now we understand, you first of all, he was someone that had a severe sickness. Number two, he was someone that had a lot of wealth. He was extremely wealthy. And then he carries on and he says that there is no one, <coughs> Afon, that there is no one to inherit from me except one daughter. So now we understand that the only heir that he has is one daughter. Should I give two-thirds of my property in charity? Should I give two-thirds of what I own? Should I give this in charity? And keep the rest for my daughter. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said no. So he asked, should I give half away in charity and give her the other half? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said no. He asked again, should I give one third away and keep the rest for my daughter? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, give away one third wa kathir. And he said that a third is still a lot. So yeah, he needs to find out from the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Should I, what should I give in charity? How much of my wealth should I be giving in charity? Should I give it out as handouts? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prevented him from doing that because Sa'ad at that period was suffering from an illness which was feared might result to his death. So, to get us into the understanding, Sa'ad was suffering from a severe illness. Something that could result in his death. So what he wanted to do, he wanted to give away his money in charity at this moment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is carried on with the explanation. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prevented him from handing out more than one third of his wealth. This is because it is not permissible for the individual suffering a life-threatening sickness to donate more than one third of his property because his state has become tied to the rights of the others, meaning the heirs. So listen carefully. I will repeat this. Someone is suffering a life-threatening disease. So there are certain sicknesses that you're going through a great deal. And the ulama, they come to, um, not the ulama, but it's the doctors. They'll say that maybe someone has a few months to live or sex, you know, it's a cancer patient, whatever it might be. Obviously, this is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many people has come with the medical fraternity they have said that this person might not see the next month? The person lives on for 20, for 30 years. This is biyadillah. This is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows best. However, if this person is extremely ill, and generally the doctors, they can say this person is not going to survive very long. With regards to their wealth, they cannot hand out more than one third. At this time, because now the estate has become the right of other is as well. Right? And this might become clearer as we move on. But as for the one who is healthy, so the one who is healthy, Alhamdulillah, he is not ill. The illness might be just a very mild illness, not life-threatening. So he can give out whatever he desires, whether he wants to give out one-third, whether he wants to give out a half, whether he wants to give out two-thirds, or his entire state, there is no blame on him. However, it is not necessary that he donates his entire wealth except if he anticipates something he certain will make independent of the servants of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, let's repeat this. So, someone is extremely in terminal life-threatening illnesses. Doctors say that 
He's not going to live very long. She's not going to live very long. To them, they can only give out up to one third because there are other ears. That plays a role in this incident. As for someone else, Alhamdulillah, they are healthy. They are not sick or they have a bit of a mild illness. For example, maybe a bit of some high blood pressure. Maybe they diabetic, but Alhamdulillah, it's not life-threatening at this moment. And they desire to give one-third, they desire to give a half of the estate, they desire to give two-thirds or even the entire estate to an organization, to something, they are in their right, they are able to do this and there's no problem and no blame on them from the side of the Sharia. And Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The point here that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is preventing this person from giving more than one third of his property. He says give away one third and that is still a lot or that is still big as the hadith says either kathirun or kabir. So this contains evidence that it is better and more perfect if it is less than one third. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says Give away one third, wathuluthun kathir, or wathuluthun kabir. But one third in itself is a lot. One third in itself is big. So here some of the ulama, they've said that this gives us evidence that the better way, the more perfect way is that you give less than one third. And for this reason, Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he said, were the people to reduce it from one third to a quarter because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said give away one third and that is still too much then Ibn Abbas says then this will be good Abu Bakr radiallahu an he said that I am pleased with what Allah is pleased with for himself that is to say one fifth and so he bequeathed one fifth may Allah be pleased with him so here we understand that the people's bequeathal of one third in the present times is, even though it is allowed, it is not the best thing to do. So rather give a quarter or one fifth. So this is something that you will put in your will. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a certain amount of wealth. So you will put in your will that one fifth needs to go to for example, the Tayyibah organization. One fourth needs to go to another organization. Needs to go to the masjid. Or even a third. However, like we mentioned, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he gave a fifth. Even Abbas said that you should be given a quarter. Because based on what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa thuluthun kathir. Our ulama. May Allah be pleased with them. They said the most appropriate is to hand down one fifth. It is to hand down one fifth and not more. Following the line of conduct of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, who was the first Amir of this Ummah after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the first leader after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first of the Khulafa of Arba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he then says that it is better to leave you as well off than to leave them poor begging people for their needs. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says it is better that you is whoever is going to inherit whether it is above you or whether it is below you. So when we have Right? The deceased, for example, they will either be people above them, meaning his father or his mother, Jad and Jadda, grandfather and grandmother, etc. So those above him. Then we have the deceased and we have those below him, which is his children. Then we have those who are on the side. So on the one side you'd have his 
wife or if he had more than one wife would have his wife and his wives and on the other side would have siblings right he, if he had sisters and brothers etc so it is better for the person that passes away that writes the will that has a will that he leaves his ears well off instead of them becoming poor instead of them going to people and asking for their needs so this is that for you to leave the estate and not give it out in charity so that when you pass away and the ears inherited from you they will become rich therewith and this is better than leaving them poor without anything begging people for their needs this is exactly what's going to happen that they will start stretching out their palms they will start asking the people to give them money because they do not have money to survive this is also proof that it is better for the deceased to leave wealth for his heirs an individual should not think that if he leaves the wealth behind and it is inherited and taken over that he will not be rewarded for this right again someone he writes a will and he leaves wealth behind he should never think that this inheritance is not rewarding for him but indeed you will get rewarded for this you will certainly get rewarded for this in fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that it is better to leave your ears well off than to leave them poor because when you leave wealth before or for your ears they benefit from it and they are your relatives but if you give it out to non-family members rather they benefit from it there's no doubt and giving it out to relatives is more rewarding than giving it out to non-relatives and this as well with one sadaqah sometimes we find that we have family members we have distant family members that might be not in the best of positions they might not have a lot of wealth and yet we find that people they are supporting this project they are supporting that project alhamdulillah ala kulli hal this is good there's no doubt we need to support the masajid we need to support islamic institutes but also you need to support your family members you will find sometimes that families they are extremely wealthy and they their own brothers their own siblings their siblings children they are suffering they can't afford to send their children to certain universities they can't afford to let their children have a good education they can't afford to sometimes pay the they bond to pay their rent but yet you will find someone is building a masjid the uncle the brother he's building this he's doing that yes alhamdulillah it is khair but why not give half there and why not give half to your family why is it that certain families and some people have come to us some people explain this that you know student of knowledge come I've spoken to you I have family members they are extremely wealthy but we still need to go for handouts to certain organizations certain relief organizations when we go to our families they close the door on us they do not want to help us so this should never be the case if you are able and you have family members that are struggling and you can afford it then help them out because this will be more rewarding to you than just helping out someone else and Allah knows best the prophet in sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you will not spend anything in charity for the sake of Allah except that you would be rewarded for it whatever you spend in charity my beloved students know that you will be rewarded for this even the morsel of food 
As the Prophet Sallallahu says, even the morsel of food in which you feed your wife with. So he's saying, you will not be spending anything. Whether it is one dirham, whether it is a dinar, whether you have bought clothing, whether you have bought bedding, whether you are buying food, and whether it is for a charitable organization, whether it is for some sad family member, or whether it is for your household, for your wife, for your children, for your parents, then know that this is seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. هَذَا لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ this is seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is going to reward you for this. As the Prophet also mentioned, even if it is just giving the morsel of food to your wife. So the point here that we need to take note of is that we're seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is subhanallah, you will seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face, seeking his reward, that you hope to be admitted into paradise with that, so that we can see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mighty and the sublime. The people of Jannah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the people of Jannah. We will see, or they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free from all his imperfections. They will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is free from all imperfections. Who is the most exalted? He is the most high. They will clearly see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their eyes as they plainly see the sun without any clouds obstructing it and how they see the moon during the nights of the full moon and this my beloved brothers this my beloved sisters this is the dream of every believer that yes Allah enters us into Jannah Alhamdulillah but that when we are in Jannah when we in just Jannah, when we reach that Jannah to Firdaus, where Allah make us all of those that will enter into Jannah, that the day or the most beautiful thing of Jannah, the pinnacle of our entrance into Jannah, of our stay in Jannah, is that day when we are going to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That indeed you are going to see your Lord. إِنَّكُمْ سَتَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ كَمَا تَرَوْنَ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدْرِ Like how you see, you are going to see your Lord in Jannah. Like how you see the full moon. Or you see the moon when it is full on the 13th, the 14th, and 15th of every month. And Allah knows best. This will be the best thing that can happen to the inhabitants of Jannah, that they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How it befits His Majesty, obviously. But we believe that we will see Allah azza wa jal as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in many a hadith. And that is also to say that they shall most truly see Allah azza wa jal. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he carries on and he says, that even the morsel of food that you feed your wife, that is even the piece of food that you give your wife, you will earn rewards for it if you intend it to do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you went out and you bought food. Alhamdulillah, you did this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get rewarded. Even or despite the fact that nafaka, that maintaining one's wife, this is wajib, this is compulsory. There is no alternative. Right? We have to support our wives, this is compulsory. But even having said this, that it is compulsory, if giving the food, it is to re- gain rewards from Allah Azza wa Jal, then you will do this. See, 
the intention plays a very important part that whatever I do I do it for the sake of Allah when I'm going for a run I'm doing this so I can get stronger so that I can worship Allah Azza wa Jal better I'm studying hard so that I can benefit the ummah so that I can get rewarded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so whatever we do I'm drinking a glass of water I'm having a small meal Oh Allah, so I can get strong, so that I can assist your deen. So everything that we're doing for the sake of Allah, and Allah Azza wa Jal is going to reward us bi idnillah for this. And remember, as Sheikh Uthaymin, he mentions that and he says that if you do not maintain the spouse, you do not maintain your wife, then you will be required to either do so or to leave her to divorce her. Yet, if you spend on your wife, seeking Allah Azza wa Jal's bounties, seeking his rewards, then know that Allah will reward you for this. Likewise, when you spend on your children, you spend on your mother, on your father, even on yourself, seeking the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then know that Allah will reward you for this. They of the Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Allah be pleased with him, he says, Would I be left behind by my companions? Meaning, will I be left at the back after my companions leave? That is, will I stay after my companions and so I will die in Makkah? The Prophet wasallam he explained to him that he will not be left behind. He, the Prophet wasallam he says to Sa'ad, that you will never be left behind. Additionally, he explained to him that even if he was left behind and then he carries out any good deed, then surely he will gain the position and the prestige in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, just to explain this, if taken as or given that you are left behind and you are unable to leave Makkah. So he's unable to leave Makkah, but you do a good deed. Seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward, then know that Allah is going to elevate you in prestige and rank. He will elevate you in standing and rank and in great position. Meaning that Allah will raise you, O Sa'ad. Allah will raise the, those companions with a high place in paradise with doing deeds in Makkah even though they emigrated from it. Because as we know, certain deeds in Makkah has more virtue than certain deeds outside Makkah. For example, the Salah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, that the Salah in Mecca, so much reward. Salah in Medina, so much reward. Salah in Beitul Maqdis, so much reward. And they were forced to leave Mecca. Here the Prophet Sallallahu explains to them that you will still be rewarded as if you were in Mecca and Allah knows best. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you will remain, meaning, this phrase will remain here has or means different from the first one. If you survive, you will remain. Meaning that you will live a long life in this world, O Sa'ad. And this exactly happened to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. He was granted such a long life. Such that according to the scholars, he left 17 male children and 12 female children as well. Whilst he only had a female child at the beginning. However, he was granted a long life and blessed with children, 17 sons and 12 daughters. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant those that do not have children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them offspring as well as those that have children. Let them be pious offspring and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So he said, that you will survive 
until some people are benefited by you and some are harmed by you. And this actually happened. That Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, may Allah be pleased with him, he lived a long life and he had a great impact in many Islamic conquests. He won extraordinary conquests. And so the people, yani the Muslims, they benefited from Sa'ad. They loved Sa'ad. But obviously, those that did not believe in Islam, the enemies of Islam, they were harmed by Sa'ad. And this is meant by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you will survive until some people have benefited from you and some people have been harmed by you. So those that have benefited were the believers. Those that were harmed by Sa'ad were those that they opposed during the jihad and those that opposed the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, O oh Allah, complete my companions' immigration for them. He supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete the hijrah of his companions for them. And this implies two things. Number one, that the fairness or the firmness of what? Upon iman, upon faith. Because if a person is firm on faith, he will be steadfast upon his hijrah as well. The second issue that none of them should return to Mecca after he had left the city as an immigrant to Allah and his messenger because when you leave a land as an immigrant to Mecca to Allah and his messenger it is like money handed out in charity. The land may be likened to the money you give out in charity and it is not possible for you to take back. Likewise Everything that an individual leaves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he should not return to this. And this is something very important. Right? And here the Shaykh, Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullahu ta'ala, he uses the example of television. And the Shaykh rahimahullahu ta'ala, he says that many people, they have been favored, alhamdulillah, that many people, they have been favored to rid their homes of television. They have been favored to rid their homes of television. By turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abstaining from this and its evils. So after a while, the same people, they come and they ask, is it permissible for us to bring back the television into our homes? So now the Sheikh he says that we say no. And the reason why we say no is that after you are done away with it to please Allah, you cannot bring it back into your home. Once you bring it back into your home, this is going to lead you back to where you were, to watching haram, seeing haram, etc. So you left something for the sake of Allah, you cannot and you should not be going back to that. And this Obviously, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, honorable students, this obviously goes for everything that we do. Someone maybe committed zina. So he left doing zina because he's doing this for the sake of Allah. I'm not going to get involved in haram. You cannot return or you should not be returning to that haram. Also, I would like to add that when doing something wrong, we should never justify it. And the reason for this is that, like the Sheikh, he mentioned the issue with regards to television, with regards to TV. So we can sit and we can argue that in today's times, everyone has a television in their house and everyone watches television and everyone watches this on television and this on TV and we need to watch Netflix and we need to watch DSTV, etc., etc., and let us understand something. And this goes for all things that is either sinful or could lead to sin. That we as an ummah should be never or we should never justify our wrong. Admit that we are wrong. Ya Allah, I've heard. Ya Allah, I've watched that series. I've watched that movie. And oh Allah, forgive me for this. 
But there should never be that, oh no, you know, there's nothing wrong. Everyone is doing it. This sheikh is watching. This da'i on his Facebook put out he Watch this. And, you know, no. We shouldn't fall into that trap. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide and protect us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, And do not cause them to turn on their heels. Meaning, do not let them renounce iman. And turn back on the heels to go back to disbelief. Because disbelief is backwardness. While faith is advancement. Imagine, subhanAllah. Disbelief, sin, innovation, bid'ah. Following your desires. This is backwardness. And iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Making salah, paying zakah, doing Islamic acts. Following the sharia. Staying away from bid'ah, following the sunnah, staying away from shirk, wa na'udhu billah. This is advancement. But in today's time, people, with regards to sin, with regards to innovation, with regards to disbelief, etc., they think that this is advancement. Supporting this type of organization that might be doing wrong, supporting this type of group that is calling to LGBT, or this group that is going into whatever you want to, whatever it might be, certain ideologies. And then we think that being with them is going forward. Being with them is advancement. And leaving the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something small. Teaching a risala, teaching a book, calling the people to worship one Allah. But this is something old. This happened years ago. Why are you still doing this? Why are you teaching the books of the past? The reason why we've become backwards, the reason why we are in the state that we are in, because the foundation of our deen, the foundation of what we are following, is shaky. Ask someone, meet someone, intelligent person, earning a certain good amount of money monthly, What are the shurud of the salah? What are the arkan of the salah? He needs to know this. You meet a businessman, mashallah, big business. Brother, do you know the rulings on riba? Do you know the rulings of signing a contract? And now people start to Waver. Now they start to feel uneasy. And this we will look at a bit later bi idnillahi ta'ala. So know that Islam is advanced. It is an advancement and know that this belief is backwardness. And this is contrast to what the atheists, for example, they say today. And they describe Islam as retrogressive. They describe Islam as something that is archaic. That's something that comes from the past. Medieval. They claim that they are progressive. The modern is the same. They claim that they are progressive and that we or those people that are following the Sunnah, that are calling the people to Tawheed, that are calling the people to Sunnah, that you know, you guys are backwards. That we need to become more liberal. We need to re-look at the Quran. We need to re-look at the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa na'udhu billah. This is happening. And again, if our faith is not strong, if the foundation has not been cemented well, the house is going to start shaking. You're going to find that you will have cracks. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide and protect us. We also find that the believers, that they are progressive, that the iman based or of what that pro progress is based on the iman, whilst not following this, is turning on the heels as the Prophet wasallam said, and do not cause them to turn on their heels. So this hadith, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, this hadith shows us and teaches us a lot of 
benefits. It gives us a lot of beneficial lessons, such as visiting the sick. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to go visit Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that there are five things that a Muslim has the right over the next Muslim with. And one of this is that when he is sick, his brother will come and visit him. This is the haq that the sick has over the other Muslims. That when he is sick, that they should go and visit. And as for the visitor, he will be fulfilling the rights of his Muslim brother. Because this is part of one's iman. This is part of your Islam. That you visit someone when they are ill. Furthermore, if an individual visits the sick, he should continue to remain or to remind him about paradise, about Jannah. About that he's going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So sometimes what the Sheikh is saying or what he's trying to imply is that sometimes we go visit someone. And what happens? Okay, let's, before we get there, let me just go back a bit. So when you visit someone, this also reminds you as a person, Alhamdulillah, I am healthy. Allah has given me health. And I've seen my brother, we've seen our sister, they're not extreme, experiencing the best of health. So this should make us contemplate as well on the health and the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. This also brings about love and affection. That when we visit the sick, we should be speaking to them. We should speak about happy occasions, good times. Tell him that you are going to become healthy one day. Tell him we are going to be together one day. Don't put him through anxiety. Don't put him through distress. Don't put, put them through more sickness. Sometimes we find a person, they visit someone and you know, subhanallah, they make this, this person is in the hospital. He's going through severe sickness. Now I come and I just dampen the mood even more. So he says, you know, my stomach, whatever, I'm it's not feeling that well, uh, not having a good day. Yeah, you know, um, Brother Fulan, I had a cousin, he had the same thing with you. And he only survived two days and he passed away. You know, yes, it's fine, but when he came home, it took him 10 years to use the bathroom, whatever it might be. But the point is that the Sheikh is trying to make that when you go and go visit someone, speak good. Make them feel happy. MashaAllah, you are looking fine today. I came to visit you last week. And subhanAllah, see how you look today. You are you are even smiling more. You're looking strong. You're looking healthy. Today you're in a good state. Make them feel well. No person wants to be in hospital. No person wants to be in bed ill. So try and always speak to them and encourage them. <clears throat> and people on knowledge is that if a visitor, right, so if you go to the visitor, try to recite with him as well. Try to make dua for them. Right, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, taught us a dua, adhi bil ba's, rabba nas, washfi anta shafi, la shifa'un illa shifa'u, shifa'an la yugadiru saquma. That, Remove the harm, the Lord of mankind. Give healing. You are the healer. There is no healing except from the healing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A healing which will leave no illness. So this is a dua. Prophetic dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us. So when you go there, you blow on the patient. 
and you start reciting this dua, you start reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. These are all shifa that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us as an ummah to do. The Prophet Sallallahu right, we mentioned that you can read Surah Fatiha as well, and this came from the incident of a person that was stung with a scorpion, and Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, another point that we would like to look at is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentions in this hadith that okay, um, yes so we covered the sickness the next point the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentions and he says that it is incumbent or this is a benefit that we derive from this hadith, not something the Prophet said, <coughs> but something that we take. That it is important that we consult people of knowledge, that we consult the people of knowledge with regards to our issues that we have. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, may Allah be pleased with him, he seeks knowledge from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He asks about two-thirds. He asks, the Prophet Sallallahu explains to him and until he ended up a, to a third. And this, my beloved brothers and sisters, is extremely important. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you do not know. So I need to know something about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We consult the students of knowledge. We consult the ulama. We consult the du'at. I want to buy a car. I will ask the mechanic. I will ask someone that knows. It was COVID-19. I go to Ahlul Fun. I go to the people of the field. To the doctors. To the scientists. This is who we speak to. And generally this is what people do. But when it comes to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we go to Sheikh Google. Go to Sheikh Yahoo. We made them not just sheikhs, but we made them muftis. This is where we get our deen from. from Facebook, from Instagram, from Twitter. How does one learn one's deen from this? This causes folder, this causes... It brings what? What does it bring? It brings harm. It brings this deen into a mess. Because we are going to all the wrong people trying to get fatawa. Trying to get issues about this. We forgot going to the scholars. We forgot going to the students of knowledge. We forgot going to the du'at. But I need to know something about deen. Let's go ask everyone besides the ulama. Let's go ask everyone besides the students of knowledge. This is one part. The second part is that when it comes to deen, then we all have an opinion. That we all need to speak. Allah says, Ya you alladina amanu, oh you who believe. La tu kadimu baina yadai la you are rasuli. What the kulla? In Allah samiyun ali. Oh you who believe. Do not put forward your opinion above that opinion of the messenger. I mean, of Allah and the messenger. What the kulla and fear Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيُّنْ عَلِيمٌ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O oh, you who believe لا تَرْفَعُوا أَسْوَاتَكُمْ فَوْقَ صَوْتِ النَّبِي And one of the explanations of this verse is O oh, you who believe do not raise your voice above that of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Do not raise, put your opinion forward if there is the opinion of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم the Prophet ﷺ has taught you. So why put your opinion forward? 
I feel that this is right. Man anta? Who are you? You have no knowledge of the Arabic language. You have no knowledge of usul al-fiqh. You have no knowledge of mustalah al-hadith. You have no knowledge of the sciences of Islam. But we become the first to comment. We become the first to type long articles on Facebook. Long comments on Instagram. But yet we don't understand the intricacies of this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, if you have knowledge, and Allah has benefited you with knowledge, and you know a mas'ala, and someone asks you, then by all means answer. But this, what we are speaking about is that people go to unqualified people and expect deen masayil. You're not going to go to someone that just read a book on a heart transplant and you're going to go to him and expect an operation. You're not going to call someone to build your house, but he has no knowledge of building. He maybe just read a few things. But when it comes to your Jannah and Jahannam, then we trust anyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us and grant us the understanding. And like I mentioned, this is extremely important that our knowledge should be taken from those who know. <coughs> and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, so the first point that we derive from this hadith is with regards to visiting the sick. The second one is with regards to taking knowledge, ask those who know, if you do not know. And I would just like to add one thing to knowledge, is that we also, with regards to knowledge, we need to know how to use this knowledge. Sometimes what happens? Sometimes we have the knowledge, but we don't know how to use it. So there's a situation. Right? There's maybe two brothers. And they have a certain altercation. There are certain issues that needs to be sorted out. So a third person comes. And yes, Alhamdulillah, he has knowledge. But he doesn't know how to handle the situation and he blows the whole thing out of proportion, etc. Or someone he has knowledge, he knows that this is haram, this is haram, etc. So he sees someone doing wrong and he just bursts out. No, you know, la taf'al, you cannot do this, you need to do this. If al wa la taf'al, do this, don't do this, etc. But without having the correct hikmah, without understanding how to do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen, al-amr bin ma'roof wa nahi ani munkar, it is the earth, it has its place. But how do you do this? This is extremely important. Another point of this hadith is the vi- that it is vi- vital for the individual to consult those that are more intelligent and more knowledgeable than him. Also, it is important that we seek advice to relate to the matter exactly as it is and that we do not have or cause more obstacles with regards to this matter. And then Sheikh Uthaymin, he explains the whole issue again of the daughter and the one-third, etc., etc. This hadith also, like we mentioned, Number one, about sick, going to the sick and certain masail regarding that. Number two, asking those that, no. Number three, looking at those who is important to go to. So you need to also look at who you go to. Not everyone that has a beard, not everyone that wears a thobe, not everyone that came out of an institute is going to be able to answer all your questions, so you need to go to those that you feel most comfortable with and that the ulama have said and that they are trustworthy people with regards to the knowledge and Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And there are a few more points that the sheikh brings, for example, um, again he speaks about the 
or the non-permissible ability of an individual with a life-threatening illness to give out more than one-third and we discussed this already so there's no need to go into so much detail with regards to this. Another point that the Sheikh brings with regards again as something to do with giving less than one-third, one-fourth and a fifth we discussed this and we said that this is better and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Another point of benefit of this hadith is that if individuals are wealthy or their wealth is only a meager and his ears are poor then he should be looking after his family members first before going out further and again this we discussed in detail. Amongst the other points of benefit from the hadith is that this shows us the miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told Sa'ad that you will not be left alone. You will not be left behind and you will survive to the extent that some people will suffer through you whilst others will benefit. This shows us that Sa'ad, okay, first of all, that Sa'ad lived until the reign of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. So this proves the Prophet's statement that you will live a long life. This also shows us the prophecies of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that some people will love you. We've seen this that the Muslims, they loved him. Some people will hate him. Those enemies of Islam, they hated Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Another important point that if you do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do then you and you do it with a correct intention you will seek the rewards of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala another point of benefit that if a person spends on his family etc Allah azza wa jal will definitely reward him if his intention is good and this brings us to the end of tonight's lesson to the end of this hadith and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings. This was a very beautiful hadith. This was a hadith where we had extreme benefits. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those that understands this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To make us of those that we can take benefit. As I always mention that reading a hadith or looking at the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is not just merely for entertainment. It is not just merely so that, oh, okay, alhamdulillah, um, we take some benefit, I sat and, I took, and we can go home. No, but we need to see how we can implement all of this in our lives. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته